This is the Nike Air Max 270, and I see this shoe everywhere, in the gym, on the streets, working out. That's twice at the gym, pretty much everywhere. So it has to be one of Nike's most popular shoes that's come out in the last five years to a decade, and everyone swears they're the most comfortable thing they've ever put on their foot, which would lead you to assume that it's one of the best Nike shoes ever made. But when I put this thing on, I immediately felt like Everyone's just been gaslighting each other. So we're gonna cut this thing in half, run it through our test to find out, is this air unit actually pressurized? How easy is, is it to pop? How much air is in there? Does the air actually do anything? And is, is it wearable when it's popped? And most importantly, why do I think everyone is wrong about this shoe? Did you know in 2020, there was over 5 million car crashes? That's over 15,000 per day and over 600 per hour. And that's where the sponsor of this video, Morgan & Morgan, comes in because they are the nation's largest law firm and in some cases, size does matter. And there's certain things that you need to do anytime there's any kind of accident. Number one, make sure you're okay. Number two, make sure you get a police report filed. Number three, contact your insurance. And number four, make sure you have good legal representation. And that fourth step that is really vital to any kind of accident usually gets forgotten or doesn't get done quite the right way. And that's why it's so nice with Morgan & Morgan that you can file a claim in eight clicks or less. And that's because they've modernized the injury law process by making it super easy to submit your claim. And you can submit your case details, sign contracts, upload documents, and medical records all from your cell phone. And you can even text your attorney and legal team throughout the entire duration of the case. So if you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan and you can submit that claim in eight clicks or less without having to leave your couch. So for more information, go to forthepeople.com or dial pound law, that's pound 529 from your cell phone and thanks again to Morgan & Morgan. But first, what is this shoe? Like I said, it's a Nike Air Max 270. It weighs 11.4 pounds. It retails for $160. It's made in Vietnam. And the way that Nike positions this shoe is put a bounce in your step with a Nike Air Max 270, named for the extra large Max Air unit that wraps around the heel these sneakers combine soft cushioning with a sock-like fit of a stretchy inner sleeve, add a lightweight airy upper and a sporty low-cut collar, and you've got the perfect kicks for every day. To be honest, it does look pretty cool. I do like the look of it. It's very like almost like a hot rod where you've got like a lot of the engine in the back and it's all bulky and all the text back here and it's streamlined up in the front. It has that it has that look that I understand why it's popular. But to understand the shoe, you kind of have to understand the history of Air Max and how it fits in the timeline, even though we've covered like three times. We're just gonna give you the cliff notes. 1987, Nike releases the Air Max 1 with the very first visible air unit that we recovered a couple weeks ago. The next shoe that we did was in 1995, the Air Max 95 was the very first visible heel and four foot air unit. Then fast forward to 2017 and the Vapor Max releases and that was the very first Air Max with no foam whatsoever, even though that's not true if you go watch that video. And it was the very first time that you were actually standing on that air unit. And then in 2018, the Air Max 270 comes out. But for the first time ever, Nike changed up what they did because the Air Max shoes are no longer about performance and the 270 is the first Air Max that's all about lifestyle. And like they said, it was designed to be the ultimate lifestyle shoe and it was perfectly positioned for that athleisure wear trend where everybody was just wearing workout clothes all day, every day without even breaking a sweat. So I think that's a big part of why this popped off because we saw the, the, the peak of Air Max technology the year before and then they settled it down a little bit, focused on the heel, made a shoe for the market instead of doing what they did with the Vaporfly by making the most extreme Air Max, taking that technology to the most extreme as a proof of concept. This is a reduced and specifically designed shoe for that athleisure era. So what is it about this shoe that makes me feel like everyone's fooling each other and themselves and gaslighting? Well, let's start going through this thing and see if we can identify what it is, starting with the upper first. And unfortunately, there is no leather on the shoe, which is a bummer for me because as a professional leather worker, that's what I value most and have the most fun reviewing, but it's mostly just like a spacer mesh upper with some TPU overlays and some almost fake looking leather around the heel. And the way that it's it's built is actually pretty smart because it is a, a, a very simple upper that gives you some structure by the lining being similar to the Yeezys where it's, it's not a lining per se, but it's more of a structured uh, support on the inside of the shoe. We put it on the flame and as you probably guessed it just lit up especially with this spacer mesh and because of the lace stays are so different on all the Air Max we've been doing the pull test and this one performed pretty averagely and it came in at 92 pounds so the lower end of the Air Max is but still within the relative range that we've tested and it is a unique upper you know it looks cool it's mostly a pull-on shoe with these two tabs of pull-on and it's you know, the laces are kind of skewed, so it is a very athletic looking shoe. But then there's, and there's really nothing in the upper that screams gaslighting or everyone's fooling themselves. And even if you start pulling some of the materials out, like pull the insole out, it's a very standard Nike insole, just open cell foam, strobel stitched, 
their typical lasting material. So where's all this gaslighting that I was talking about and the fooling of, of the consumer? Well, it's all in the midsole and air unit. And actually, you know, instead of telling you exactly what I felt and then trying to prove it with the data, let's go over the results first and see if you guys can guess from the data what the issue is. So starting first, is it pressurized? Well, we stuck our little pressure meter in there and it flew off the charts. It was up there with the highest test results, which, you know, it's a little bit skewed because it's not the most scientific, but there's tons of air in this thing. It is very, very pressurized. What about how much air is in here? Well, this tops the chart with the biggest single air unit at 140 cc's. So by far the most pressurized and the biggest air unit that we've seen so far. What about how easy it is to pop? Well, to be honest, it's right in the same range, right around 56 pounds to puncture through. But the thing that worries me about the puncturing of this is how far out the bubble actually sits compared to where your heel is. So I don't know, just like, I feel like dragging your heel. If you're driving a car, there's a lot of spots where you could potentially pop that, but the location is a little bit concerning for multiple reasons. Then what about now that it's popped, is it still wearable? Well, here's the weird thing. Every single other Air Max out there that we reviewed, you can still wear. It's kind of feels like you're walking in sand. But with this one, when we popped it, it did improve the balance of the shoe. Because when you put these on when they're popped, it almost feels more comfortable. Once you start walking, you can actually tell a difference, but just standing, to me, it's more comfortable popped. But what about the responsiveness difference between popped and not popped? Well, we did the ball drop test first, and the weird thing is, we got mixed results all over the place. We had some rounds of tests where we did 10 in a row where it was doing better, some was doing worse, and then once we finally sat down to figure out what was going on, I think it all comes back to the placement of this air unit again. It's not really underneath your heel, it's around your heel, and your heel is, is standing on this little patch of foam right here. So I don't think that means it's not working, but it's just a hard one to test because you're not actually standing on the air unit directly underneath of you. Then we did the bar drop test to simulate more human weight, and that's where we started to see the difference because unpopped was eight inches and popped was seven inches. So from the results, could you, could you guess at what the issue was? Well, to me, the thing that makes me question my reality is everyone says these are the most comfortable, most loved shoes that they've ever had. They're the best shoes in the whole world. Everyone just rants and raves about them. But I think the shoe is fundamentally flawed and that fancy visible tech is tricking people into feeling something that they're not actually feeling. Because when I first put these on my foot, I immediately felt like the shoe was on a big incline. It made me feel like my toes were immediately jammed in the front of the shoe. And after like an hour of wearing them, your toes just slowly creep to the front of the shoe and next thing you know, your toes are all curled up and they're in pain and you didn't even notice your, your foot sliding to the front. These are quite literally the most uncomfortable regular shoes that I've ever put on, at least for initial comfort, that we've ever reviewed. So if you, if you guess correctly, the answer to why this shoe is so horrible is the air unit is way too big and it's way too much of a slope to actually be a functional foot piece of footwear, footwear. Because if you look at the test results, tons of pressure, the biggest single air unit, the location of the air unit, and they feel more balanced when they're popped. So now let's cut this thing in half and see if I've just been gaslighting myself coming up with the concept for this video, or if there's actual data we can point to in the cross section to see how much the heel to toe drop is, the profile of it, and really see why it feels like you're walking downhill all day in these shoes. All right, we got it cut in half, and I think we're gonna do one more Air Max video. And I think we're gonna do like a, a viewer's choice, so comment below what Air Max you would like us to do to, to finish off this series. And I'll choose the most liked comment, unless it's really pricey or really dumb. So let us know which ones you want us to do. And now let's see what's inside. So it's exactly what I thought. Look how big this air unit is compared to the, the forefoot. Like if I grab a caliper 
at the heel from the air unit, you're like just under two inches. Compared to where your toes sit, your toes are like half an inch-ish, a little over half an inch. So you have an inch and a half of drop from your heel to the toe. To put that in perspective, like most running shoes will say like, oh, it's got a six millimeter drop, a 10 millimeter drop. This is like an inch of drop. And the thing that makes it really, really bad is if you've seen this channel, you know I like boots and boots usually have hills and you know, you would assume like, oh, an inch drops nothing compared to a boot. But the difference comes in the profile. If you look at this shoe, the way that your foot sits in this, it's almost concave. It almost is like a dish that you're standing in. So it makes sense that when you start walking around, your foot's gonna slowly slide to the front of the shoe. And it's not even that it's a straight plane, it's actually curved down. And you could make an argument here that, oh, maybe it's for the gate when they're running, but they just said that this is not a running shoe. So for a walking or a casual shoe to have this bad of a profile is uh, the reason why it sucks to wear. And you might be thinking, well, what's so different about your, your fancy boots? Well, it's all about the arch support. So if you look at this boot, it's not a straight line down to the toe. It's not a concave line down to the toe. It's actually convex because right here in the arch where you have that arch in your foot, they build up arch support so that your foot doesn't collapse, so that your foot has something to grab onto as it's wanting to slide to the front of the shoe. And it's way closer to the actual foot anatomy rather than trying to get your foot to, like, it's like standing in a bowl. This is maybe the worst profile I've ever seen in a shoe. It's crazy that they made this to me. It's so bad. You know, and, and you might be thinking, oh, all sneakers are like that. Go look at the Air Max 1. The Air Max 1 is built up with a big heel with proper profile to give you that arch support so that your foot can grip and so your foot doesn't immediately slide to the front of the shoe. So how can people think that this wildly uncomfortable shoe is so comfortable? Well, there's two reasons. The first one is people's feet, people's feet are so different and their posture is different and this might work for some people. And maybe I'm the exception to the rule. Maybe everyone else thinks these are wildly comfortable. I just don't believe it. The second reason is, after reviewing so much visual tech and gimmicky things, I think I finally realized part of the reason why brands try to make their tech so visually apparent. I think it has a lot to do with showing people what they should feel and reinforcing that with a shoe that looks like what they're trying to convince you to feel like, if that made any sense, AKA the placebo effect. If you make this look, oh look, comfy, big bubble, comfy squish, good. And then you tell people comfy, it's good for you. And they're gonna go on and they're gonna put it on and be like, oh, squishy, big, Big air, squishy. You know, it's like, it's, it really is just the placebo effect to some degree. But do I think that Nike is doing this maliciously, like they're trying to scam their customers? I don't think they are. I think it's just a natural byproduct of any sort of de uh, product design. It just happens. Anytime you're trying to make a cool product, you're gonna have gimmicks and you're gonna have people assume what that gimmick is supposed to feel like based off how it looks. And is, is it wrong for product designers to design visible tech that looks visually apparent? to what they're trying to get the consumer to fill, I don't think that's bad either. I think it, once again, is just part of product design and, and marketing and designing unique products. But the thing that I don't like about this is that the product is fundamentally flawed because of the tech and the tech is used to cover up the, the flaw. So it's literally the opposite of what I love most because this is form before function and the form ruins the functionality of the shoe. So it's completely counter to everything that I value when it comes to like footwear design. So why did this happen? Why did Nike allow this to happen? Why do the consumers assume it? Well, it's probably just like the athleisure trend. That's all about looking like performance with absolutely none of the substance. And that's what the shoe is. So let me know what you guys think. And maybe, maybe I'm way off. Let me know if you think this is the most comfortable shoe in the world. Maybe it just doesn't fit with my foot, but I have a feeling you guys are probably gonna agree with this. So thank you guys for everything you do. And, and let us know what other Air Maxes you want us to do to finish off this series for at least this year. And then we got Jordan July coming up. So let us know what other Jordans you want us to cut apart. And thank you guys for everything. See ya.